Good morning, church. You'll notice it's a little darker in here this morning. As you know, we had some lighting troubles not too long ago, and it looks like we're figuring some things out still. So uh, it'll be a little different this morning again. But our call to worship this morning is from Psalms 135. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. And we have a moment of silent and reverent anticipation before we worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for another opportunity to come into your presence, into your house, and worship you and learn from your word. God, I prepare, I prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word and to learn from it this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
go through our next question in the Heidelberg Catechism. Question 69. What is baptism? The immersion or dipping of the person in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by those who are duly qualified by Christ. Amen. You may be seated as I ask the ushers to come forward for this morning's tithes and offerings. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence to worship you. We pray that you'd soften our hearts and prepare our hearts for your word. We thank you for the blessings that you've bestowed on us. And Lord, we pray that we'd give back to you generously what's yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
us to follow you into the world. Help us to be a light to others. I pray that you would bless us with your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we confess what we believe as Christians through the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, River's Edge, and we're going to get that other set of lights on 
in a second. The reason we didn't have them on is it would have washed out the, the screen. You wouldn't have been able to see the lyrics as well. So we'll give you a moment to adjust your eyes. And we'll hopefully once again have this resolved quickly. My name is Ryan Badgerow. I'm one of the pastors here at River's Edge, and it's a blessing to get to share God's word with you today. And again, I welcome any guests or visitors. I know we have some even from California. I can't find you right now, so <laughs> I won't point you out. But it's great to have you with us or anyone viewing online with us. We actually have a few from California, but the Walsh is, uh, they're just part of us. So I was talking about other people, if you want to. We're going to take a break from our study through Luke this morning, and we're going to look at what it means to be good stewards of God's grace. And so if you turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4, we will get there in a little bit. If you're using the Bibles provided, that is page 1016, 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll mainly be looking at verses 7 through 11. But what is a steward? If we're going to talk about being stewards of God's grace, if we're going to talk about being good stewards, we should should want to know what that means. A steward is someone who is given responsibility to look after or manage someone else's property or possessions. That's the broad general sense of steward. And so when we speak of Christian stewardship, we can talk about many aspects of it, and the Bible does. But first and foremost, we remember that God created and owns all things. Everything is his. The entire universe, every blade of grass, every grain of sand, you, me, we are all created and owned by God. And so everything in creation has been given to us, specifically as, as humans, the earth. In Genesis 1, 28, Adam was told to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue the earth, to have dominion in this way, to manage and use wisely God's creation. And as creatures made in the image of God, the only creatures made in the image of God, we have this great and precious privilege. And so when we think of stewardship, it's not just concerning money or possessions or property, although it includes that. That's usually what we think of. But here in 1 Peter 4, the apostle helps us understand what it means to be good stewards of God's grace, specifically the gifts he has given us as the body of Christ. Before we dig in, let me give you some background and the context in which Peter says this, because it's quite a bit into the the letter. It's toward the end of it, actually. And so we want to know why he's saying this at this point. I will not go through the entire first part of the letter by any means, but we're, we're reminded this is Peter, the apostle. He walked with Christ. He was quite bold at times. He was, um, sure that he would never deny Christ and then did. He was restored by Christ to feed and care for the sheep, God's people. And Peter writes this letter pastorally in that way to suffering Christians who are scattered all over um, what then was, or we could call now Asia Minor, or then now would be like Turkey in that area, but other, other places. So this is away from Jerusalem. This isn't all Jewish Christians. But he's reaching out to them. He still cares about them, even if he's not there with them. Peter's reminding them that this life is temporary, that they are exiles on the earth. And that's a great reminder to us. We are exiles. And so whether you are suffering this morning, it's an encouragement. This is, it's temporary. However, it could also be a warning. If you are loving this world too much, it's temporary. So take that as an encouragement or a warning this morning. So he's writing to suffering Christians, and he starts by reminding them of their salvation, the new birth through Christ. Then he calls them to holy living, 
And we know Paul has a similar format in his letters with a basis, a foundation on Christ and these theological truths that shore up any way we live. We don't just go and do things and live a certain way, but we do it because of who Christ is and what he's done and who we are in light of that. The practice of that theology. And so after reminding these believers of their salvation, after calling them to holy living, he then gives quite specific instructions, which includes submission to governing authorities, how wives and husbands are to relate to one another, and then how all Christians should respond to suffering in, in light of the fact that Christ himself first suffered and was mistreated. And we are his disciples, and we should not expect anything different. And so we get to chapter 4, where our text is found. And before we read verses 4 through 7, just briefly look, if you have it open there, at verse 1 of chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And then into verse 2, the second part of it, live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. All right, so this life is temporary, but this is how we are to live with the time that we have. Then he goes on in verse 3 to explain the very obvious sinful lifestyle of the Gentiles, meaning the pagans, the unbelievers, idolaters. This includes drunkenness, orgies, idolatry, similar things that Paul lists in his epistles. The works of the flesh are evident. And then Peter says human passions. He's referring to the sinful passions, the sinful lusts that we have, not saying that all of our passions as humans are sinful, because that's not true. It's a common term he and Paul use. Then in verse 4, he says that unbelievers are surprised when, when we don't join in. Have you ever experienced that? People are, are sinning. They want you to sin with them. You say no, and then they're surprised that you didn't join in. I know that's happened to me, um, and it may even be with professing Christians who think something isn't a sin that is clearly a sin, and they are surprised that you don't agree and join in with them. I have experienced this, but I've also sadly joined in as well, and I'm sure many of you have, and God forgive us. Then here in verse 6 of chapter 4, it's admittedly a difficult text, we're not going to look at it today. But it is important, and I want you to know I'm not purposely skipping it. We don't normally do that um, with verses when we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. But today, we're focusing on verse 7 through 11, and someday I, will, I will, would love to go through First Peter verse by verse. I've preached on chapter 1 before, and God willing, we will do that someday. But his focus here, in light of this, that, that Christ has suffered, is that being good stewards of God's grace is what he's calling us to, ultimately. And this is an amazing privilege that we should never take lightly or think that this is something we deserved. I mean, grace in and of itself means undeserved, unmerited favor. And so if you would please stand for the reading of God's holy word in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, and we'll go through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. So God, send out your light and your truth into our hearts today and teach us, help us 
to understand what you teach us by the power of your spirit. Renew our minds, increase our faith. Lord, soften hard hearts, cause those who are dead in their sins to repent and believe and be made alive through your son, Jesus Christ. Do all this, Lord, we ask for your glory and in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So Peter started this letter reminding these believers that their situation is temporary. They are spiritual exiles as we are. This life, this world in its current state will not last forever. Verse 7, the first part, he says, the end of all things is at hand. This is not just a doomsday message from me or from Peter. Although it's true, judgment is coming and the end of all things is at hand. No, this is a great truth that should bring Christians joy, especially for these suffering Christians or for you or me who are suffering. This should bring joy, not dread, but for those who have not trusted Christ or those who are just kind of faking it, as we've been talking about in the Gospel of Luke. You should be fearful. You should dread But for the Christian, although this is true, all things are coming to an end, we should not live as escapists who think, I'm just going to just hunker down and, and deal with everything, just kind of bear it and grin, you know, and just get through until, until I die. No, Paul clearly speaks against that in, in his letters to the Thessalonians, they, many of them had just stopped working and just literally sat around waiting for Jesus to return. That's not at all the message from any of the apostles or Jesus himself. It actually brings an urgency, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And so while it's true that to be with the Lord is far better, to die is gain, First, Paul said, to live is Christ. So if we are still here, it's for Christ. So we should set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. But when we do that, it'll actually make us live with the time we have left in the way that God would have us, in a way that is pleasing to him. Peter shows us how to live in, the, in light of this reality. Not to just act like nothing really matters because everything's just going to end one day and we're just all kind of pretending like things matter. No, things do matter. The things in your life, the things going on in our world. We don't want to be Gnostics who act like all things that are physical are evil and only spiritual things are really important. No, God made us physical. He made us body and soul. And so although this life is temporary, Peter's saying this is how we are to live. In light of this truth, he declares the end of all things is at hand or near. This does not mean that he thought or was declaring he knew exactly when Jesus would return. He doesn't say that, does he? Although he walked with Christ, and some could wrongly think, well, he was pretty close with Jesus. Maybe Jesus told Peter when he would return. No, Jesus clearly told the disciples, only the Father knows. So Peter isn't a false prophet here. He's declaring a truth, a truth that Jesus himself said. The whole time between Christ's resurrection and his return is considered the last times or the last days. So he's not wrong to say this, even though it was 2,000 years ago. Some believe that Peter here, by saying the end of all things, is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem that would happen in the year A.D. 70. And so he's helping prepare these, these Christians for that. It, it could be that's the case, but 
it's most likely that if he is referring to that, he's also referring to the fact that Christ will return. Because either way, whether we die or he returns, it's happening soon. The end is near in light of eternity. And I definitely do not claim to know when Christ will return. No one should, should claim to know. If anyone does claim that they know, run from them. Pray for them, but run from them. Many have, throughout history, wrongly claimed it. Some even written books and then had to rewrite a new book because they realized they were wrong, although they explained it away or whatever. But every generation since Jesus ascended to heaven, every generation has thought that Christ's return will happen while they're living. And there have been many events in history that caused people to be certain it was the end. I mean, even thinking just the last hundred years, the Holocaust, that surely seemed like this is the end. And two world wars. That said, we should never be scoffers. Peter speaks of this in Second Peter 3. He says, there will come scoffers who say, you keep saying Christ is going to return, but everything is going on as it has. So we don't want to be those people. That was happening then. How much more is it happening now? What did Christ say in Matthew 24? He said, this is not the end. The end will not come yet, but these are birth pains. The beginning of birth pains is what he calls them. So Jesus will return. It's not if, but when. Maybe in our lifetime, it could be in 30 seconds could be in 300 years, but we believe it because he said it would happen. We just proclaimed it in the Nicene Creed that he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, and his kingdom will never end. So in light of this truth, how are we to live? The end of all things is at hand. So do we eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die? No, what does Peter say? The rest of verse 7. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So this should be our, our personal response. Because, I don't know about you, I can't control others. Have you ever tried to do that? We may think we can or hope we could. But no, he says be self-controlled. Are you self-controlled? Or do you immediately give in to every temptation and urge that you have? We spoke of it last week with Christ's temptation. Forty days of fasting. He was weak. He was hungry. He had every excuse. And he didn't give in. Proverbs 25, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5 tells us. So it's not something we can muster up. Don't get confused. Yes, it's called self-control, but it's a gift. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Once it starts to grow, we must nurture it, or it will be stunted. It's the idea of working out our salvation that we speak of so often. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us. It's the sanctification, being made holy over time, not saving ourselves. And this is something we all need to work on, self-control. Raise your hand if you don't need to work on (laughs) self-control. And we need to also help each other with it. Because remember, Peter's saying this to a group of believers. It's an individual thing that we must do, but it's for all of us. And so we can help each other in in this aspect. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Sober-minded in contrast to the drunkenness spoken of earlier. Clear-minded. And drunkenness isn't the only way that we can fog our minds up. We can just numb ourselves with entertainment and other things. So 
Don't forget that. He says, be clear-minded so that you can pray for the sake of your prayers. In other words, be watchful in your prayers. Being self-controlled and sober-minded does not mean that we act self-righteous. We should never do that. The reality is we are no better than the unbeliever. We're saved by grace. Once again, we did not muster this up ourselves. The difference, however, is that we are seeking God's will, or we should be seeking God's will, seeking to live righteously, seeking his kingdom first. And so it starts in our minds. What are you allowing into your mind? It will affect your prayers. Are we being watchful in our prayers? Are we waiting on the Lord? Yes, for his return, but also being aware of what's going on around us, the the many needs around us. And it's overwhelming. There's more than enough to pray for. Prayer is the life of a Christian. It's been said it's, it's like breathing. We can't live without breathing. We can't really live the Christian life without praying. Now in verse 8, Peter continues this command, these commands, and that's what these are, friends. They are commands. He's an apostle of Christ, okay? These aren't suggestions. And these are essentially what Jesus had already taught and, and commanded. So he's reminding the the believers of this in us. Jesus commissioned the apostles to do this, to teach everything he commanded and to teach others to actually obey what he commanded. And this next command in verse 8 is corporate. You can't obey it by yourself. You can be self-controlled by yourself for the most part, but you can't do verse 8 alone. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all. So, being self-controlled, being sober-minded is important. Extremely important, but not to the exclusion of this. He's saying, above all of this, keep this in mind. The reason you're you're being self-controlled and sober-minded is not simply for yourself, but so that you can actually love others as Christ commanded. And he says, keep loving. Why? Because we love for a little while, right? We, we bear with one another for a little while, but then we give up or we're tempted to give up on others. It's, it's fun at first, right? Everyone's excited. You're coming to church. We're loving each other, kumbaya. He says, keep loving earnestly, intensely. Not just saying we love each other, but showing it. So don't give up on each other and and don't let your love grow cold because that's what will happen if we don't put these things into practice. James also writes about this, saying similar words that love covers a multitude of sins. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrongs. And all of these are based on Proverbs 12, which says, or Proverbs 10, verse 12, which says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Love covers all offenses. And so the closer we get as a fellowship, it's just inevitable. We're going to offend one another. If it hasn't happened to you already, it will. You'll be offended. You will offend. That doesn't mean we just put up with each other and pretend to be nice just to get along. That certainly doesn't mean we act like others' sin is not a big deal if if they sin against us. And we most definitely do not cover up sin. That's not what Peter is teaching. That's not what the Bible is teaching. No, this is a picture of the gospel, ultimately, that we can forgive because Christ first forgave us. We can actually love others because God first loved us. 
His grace covers our sin. And so who do we think we are to not extend that forgiveness to others? It's not easy, but it's possible. And loving one another is not what we usually think of, just everything feeling good. No, it means even at times speaking the truth when it hurts in love because we actually love one another. Now in verse 9 and following, Peter shows what this love looks like practically. Verse 9, he says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another. So hospitality is a fruit of the love that we are called to have. What is hospitality? We may think we know. We may have an idea of what it is. Is it serving food and drinks? Inviting someone into your home? Just being welcoming in general? Well, it includes those things, but it's not all of it. Because anyone can do those things. Anyone can serve food and drinks. Anyone can invite people into their homes and just be nice. But he's speaking of genuine Christian love. Christian hospitality. And the original word, the meaning behind it of hospitality is stranger love. That's strange. Loving a stranger or a guest. So not just people we know, not just people we like, but even strangers. And of course, we know Christ reminded us even to love our enemies. And he gives the example of the Good Samaritan. And so this idea of hospitality or loving the stranger is what Moses reminds Israel of in Deuteronomy 10, where he says, just as God has loved the sojourner or stranger... You love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So we're reminded that we have been shown hospitality by others and ultimately by God. And Peter's command here to show this hospitality is specifically in the context of Christians. But we never forget this aspect of showing hospitality to even unbelievers. Hebrews 13, the writer says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So you may even be serving an angel. It's possible. We could talk about that all morning. But even in the church, there are plenty of people who you don't know that well. Strangers, you could say. And we have new folks here with us this morning, recently in our fellowship, and hopefully we always will have new people coming. Do we as River's Edge show them hospitality? Are we welcoming like Christ welcomed us? Because the reality is we were strangers. We were, in fact, enemies and rebels because of our sin. And on the cross, Jesus showed the ultimate act of hospitality in service, giving his life, welcoming us into the family of God by grace through faith. And I just want to say so many of you, and I want to thank so many of you for being great examples of this to me personally, to my family, as a church in general, just being a great example of what it looks like to be hospitable and and welcoming. Now, we never should pat ourselves on the back and think, yeah, we are are pretty welcoming. I'm sure there's plenty of folks who have left this place after the first visit and, and not thought we were welcoming. It's possible. And so we, we can always be more welcoming and, and more hospitable. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. There it is. He had to say it. 
Peter knows, ultimately God knows, and has Peter write this, he knows our tendency to complain, to grumble. It was a hallmark of the Israelites, the murmuring and the complaining. And we especially grumble, and we we feel justified in it when we have served others and welcomed others and been hospitable to others, and they didn't even seem like they cared. They weren't even thankful. Is that why you did it? (laughs) Was to get a thank you? Do you think Jesus ever grumbled? Do you think we've ever not been thankful toward him for what he's done for us? or as as grateful and thankful as we should be? Of course not. We are very often ungrateful for what Christ has done for us. And he really did have every right to grumble because he did everything right. He was the most welcoming, most hospitable, and he still is. And so whether we say it out loud or under our breath, or just in our minds, grumbling and complaining is not an act of a Christian. It's not a mark of a true Christian. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. All things without grumbling or disputing. That's a tall order. Ryan, that's impossible. You're right, it is. Apart from Jesus... We can do nothing, but through Christ, we can do all things through him who gives us strength. We can even not grumble. And when we do, which we will, we repent. We quickly admit it, forsake it, and ask him to help us not. Peter explains, he continues to explain what this love looks like that we are to have in verse 10. Not only hospitality, generally, as believers. But then he says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And so don't say, well, hospitality is not my gift. That one was, that's, that's like a given for all of us. And, and I'm not just saying just hospitality, like when we serve drinks and stuff back there before church. Although that, that's part of it. But he says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so we each have a gift from God. Remember that it's from God, a spiritual gift by his grace. You have at least one. Do you know what it is? Some have more. And this is different than natural talents and abilities, although God can use those and and have them enhance the spiritual gifts that he's given us, but These are different than just natural talents and abilities. So we can't say, well, I'm not naturally welcoming. That wasn't a gift God gave me. However, he did give me the gift of criticism. It's not listed in the Bible. And so why have we been given these gifts? He says, as each has received a gift, use it to show others how great you are and to make them wish they were you. Is that what it says? No. No. We've received a gift, and we are to use it to serve one another. It's Christianity 101, but we forget it so often. It says God's varied grace, referring to the fact that God's grace takes various forms in our lives through these gifts that he's given us. We're not all the same. We're not supposed to all be the same. We are the body of Christ. Paul shows And tells the example that, like a body, an eye is not an ear, a hand is not a foot. I usually think I'm probably one of the armpits. But hey, we need armpits, right? We need each other to fully function and to experience and display God's grace. Did you realize that? That's what Peter's reminding us here. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are very, a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So we don't want to get 
caught up in the details of what are our gifts and what are other people's and why I don't, why don't I have that gift and why do they get it? And I, no, he's focusing on the Lord. This all comes from God. There's a variety and it's supposed to be this way. God empowers them all in everyone, the same God. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, not for selfish gain. And this was apparently clear to the Corinthians. We went through the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They were misusing the gifts. This was a major problem Paul had to correct. And he similarly writes in Romans 12, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Basically exactly what Peter says. It's almost as if God wants us to actually get this. So Peter here is addressing this in his epistle. Because every church in every part of the world, in every generation, needs to be reminded, including us. Think about it. God lets us be stewards of his grace. Isn't that amazing? He lets us be a conduit, a dispenser, an administrator of his grace. That's humbling, isn't it? So the question is, are we being good stewards or bad stewards of the gifts and the grace he's given us? Are you like the guy that Jesus spoke of who received that that talent and buried it? Or will you put it to use and bless the body of Christ and in turn really bless yourself because Jesus said it's better to give than receive? So you're not doing it for a thank you. You're not doing it to get something out of it, but you will get something out of it. And in another sense, God speaks of rewarding us, not that we're earning our salvation, but it's not actually wrong to want to get something out of it. So if you want to be blessed, bless others. It's a principle. It's a spiritual principle. Will you glorify yourself or God? Because when we glorify ourselves, we sin against God and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. When we misuse the gifts God's given us to glorify ourselves. Peter goes on to explain a little of what this looks like. The varied grace. This is not an exhaustive list. Neither is Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. These are examples. And I encourage you to look those up. He says in Verse, 1 Peter 4.11, the first part, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. And so the reminder for those who preach and teach, this is God's message. He's given it to us. We are stewards. We are to say what he said, especially when it comes to the gospel, specifically. We have no right to change it. And then he says, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So no matter how you're serving, whether it's cleaning toilets, taking out the trash, serving up front, up here on the stage, neither service is better than the other, although one looks and seems more glamorous. But actually... um, I correct myself, the one who does the, the lowly work, the seemingly lowly work, is, it's probably actually better because Jesus said what? The least will be the greatest, first shall be last. He washed the stinky feet of the disciples. He told us to humbly do the same. So I would argue it's actually greater to take out the trash than to sing up here or preach, possibly. And we have many great opportunities at River's Edge to serve. And if you're not sure, just ask. As I've already alluded to, we started back up the the Sunday morning coffee and, and snacks. We have a fellowship meal coming up, two weeks. The church's birthday we're going to celebrate on the 27th. 
you want to help out with that? Setting up tables, tearing down, bringing some food. It's not all about food, though, remember. That's not all that service and hospitality is, but it's a big part. We see it in the Bible. It's a big part, and it's been a big part of this church, and it's a blessing. We also have VBS coming up in person. Yes, we're going to actually try to do it. It's kind of last minute maybe now, but we're going to shoot for it, and we need your help. This is the announcement right here in the middle of the sermon. It's at the end of July, so talk to Emily about details. There are other ways you can serve. Take someone a meal, which many of you have done, even for us recently. It's been a blessing. Visit those who are homebound. Um, whatever you can do. You might think, I don't, I don't have any extra money. I don't, I don't even have a car. Well, you probably at least have a phone. You can make a phone call. Ask someone how you can pray for them. Well, I don't have a phone. Okay, pray. You can pray. So many ways we can serve. And we do it the best that we can. We do it with excellence. Because we're not just serving others. We're ultimately serving the Lord. We're serving the body of Christ, and he is the head. And so we don't just stay inward focused, although there are many great opportunities to serve here in this local fellowship. But if we can't start serving here, if we can't start even in our own family serving one another, it's pretty unlikely we're going to serve and welcome those outside of our families in the church. Are you a consumer when you come to church? Just what can I get out of it? How can I be served? Some of you are. We all were at one point. And yes, we will get something. We will be blessed. But that should not be the only reason that we would come. Second part of verse 11. He says, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And so I just want to say this to the older saints who maybe can't serve in the capacity you once could. Doesn't make you any less. You can still serve. He says, by the strength that God supplies. It's God's strength, all right? It was never about us. When we're younger, we can do more, and we should. But older saints, you can still serve the Lord. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. It's always for the glory of God. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. All of our love shown through these various gifts that God has given us glorifies God and fulfills the greatest commandment, which is what? To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all that we are. And then, yes, love our neighbor as ourself, but it's not just about loving others. We get it backwards if we start there. We will then end up glorifying people and glorifying their needs. But it's not one or the other. It's, it's both. We love and glorify God when we serve and love others. We said it earlier. We gather to glorify God, proclaim his gospel, grow in Christ, serve his church, and devote ourselves to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter ends this section by breaking into a praise here at the end of verse 11, a mini doxology. He says, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And if you are open there in the Bible, you look over to chapter 5, verse 11, he says basically the same thing. It's as if even just talking about glorifying God causes him to break out into praise because he knows God deserves all the glory. Right then and there. This was common in Paul's writings as well. And it should cause us to do the same. God is the king. He has all power, dominion, forever. Yet he has made us stewards of his grace for the time being. And so we must keep eternity in view. The end of all things is at hand. We are exiles here. 
Therefore, Peter says we must be self-controlled, sober-minded, watchful in prayer. Love one another earnestly. Show hospitality without grumbling. Serve one another with the gifts God has graciously given to us by the strength that God supplies. And in doing all of this, we will be good stewards of God's grace and truly glorify him. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, make it so. We are so weak, but you are strong. God, help us to remember that all we have is yours and that we are stewards. Help us to be good stewards. Lord, our lives are not even our own. We are bought with the price, the precious blood of your son. Lord, help us to be good stewards of the grace and the gifts that you've given us. And Lord, for those who aren't sure what their gifts are, show them. And may we all humbly serve one another and not wait to do that until we think we know what our gift is, but to just serve. And God, help us not to grumble or complain and forgive us for doing so. May we be more like you, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to sing a cappella. The first verse and chorus of To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. His voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Romans 15. Paul says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And before I dismiss you, I just want to recognize and not glorify them, but recognize um, some people here. Mercy Gundon, are you in here? She's hiding. She just graduated high school. Let's give her a big hand. <clears throat> the last, last student of Sandy Oaks. She's homeschooled, if you didn't know that. And also Connor Smith, who graduated from North Huron. He isn't able to be with us this morning. But him and his family are newer to the church, so get to know them. Also some honorable mentions, Iva and Dylan, who of course are getting married, just graduated from Reformation Bible College in Florida. Yeah. <clears throat> also, Jake's not here. I didn't tell him I was going to do this. Jake Bushy graduated from Michigan State University, and Mariah Caston, or Bold as we know her, graduated from the University of Michigan. So be praying for these, these young folks, and for you, Mercy, I have a gift for you. So God bless you. You're dismissed. <clears throat>